The webinar is being recorded and we'll make sure that all the registrants get a link. The Office for Intellectual Freedom has identified a significant number of censorship attempts to books that address health, sex, gender identity, and adolescence. So today we're going to talk with two incredible authors and two defenders of intellectual freedom, and I will introduce them to you right now. Raised in the 1970s by a children's librarian and a sex therapist, Corey Silverberg grew up to be a sex educator, an author, and queer, not necessarily in that order. Corey received a master's degree in education from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Since 1997, he has developed and facilitated workshops for hundreds of agencies and organizations serving both youth and adults across North America on a range of topics, including gender expression and identity, sexuality and disability, sexual pleasure, sexual communication, technology, and access plus inclusion. He is the co-author of three books, most recently, the ALA Stonewall Honor Book, Sex is a Funny Word, with Fiona Smith. Most of Corey's work is collaborative, working across and within the spaces that divide race, gender, embodiment, disability, and identity. His life is full of kids. All of them know where babies come from, and some know more. Mariko Tamake is the award-winning co-creator of the graphic novels This One Summer with Jillian Tamaki, and Lauren Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me with Rose Rosemary Valerio O'Connell. She also writes about heroes, villains, and mutants for Marvel and DC Comics and curates the Abrams LGBTQ imprint, Shirley Books. Buzzy Nielsen is a self-professed policy wonk who happens to also direct the Crook County Library in Oregon. He spent most of his 20-year library career working in and advocating for rural libraries. His wonkishness is put to good use as chair of the Oregon Library Association's Library Development and Legislation Committee. Jackie Mills has been a librarian for 28 years, working in four different states. And while most of her career was spent in elementary and middle school libraries, she has also been a children's librarian in a public library, an assistant librarian in an academic library, and a branch manager of a public library, and is currently the library director of a small rural library in Oregon. An MLS graduate of University of North Carolina Greensboro, Jackie is passionate about every area of librarianship except scheduling, and is a zealous defender of intellectual freedom and the freedom to read. I am Kristen Picol. I'm the assistant director of ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. I am the first contact for support to librarians and educators who experience censorship. I was a youth librarian in West Bend, Wisconsin, and I experienced a book challenge in 2009 to over 80 LGBTQYA books. I have a new book out last year in May titled Beyond Banned Books, Defending Intellectual Freedom Throughout Your Library, published by ALA Editions. In my free time, which is not a lot, I love um, to work jigsaw puzzles and watch the Green Bay Packers. So we're going to jump right into some questions. Um, Corey, so sex is a funny word has been called, quote, nothing short of revolutionary. It was also among the most banned and challenged books in 2017 and 2019. Mm -hmm. Challenged for encouraging children to ask questions about sex and for discussing gender, gender identity. <clears throat> Is that why you decided to write Sex is a Funny Word? Uh, sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. Um, so it was kind of the logical extension of our first book. So Fiona and I, in 2012-ish, wrote a book called What Makes a Baby that was a book about, all about reproduction that was written to work for any kind of family. So it, wasn't, it didn't sort of center one story about a man and a woman, and sperm and an egg, and um, it sort of told lots of different, it, it allowed people to tell a lot of different stories about how reproduction works. 
Um, and what we, I became aware of was that, that all the books for kids about sexual health and sex education, they always start with and kind of center reproduction. And I wanted a book that didn't. So I'm most, mostly interested when I write books, I'm mostly interested in writing things that just aren't there. Um, so Sex is a Funny Word became that book. It became this book that talks about gender and touch and boundaries and consent and doesn't actually talk about reproduction at all. And that was sort of the first kind of impetus for it. And it's also one of the first books to include, um, you know, the first sex education books to be inclusive of LGBTQIA and gender identity for right. youth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Why was this important for you? Well, because I'm queer. So the, the, the big reason is, again, because, I mean, we sort of write books on the books that we want. We write, I mean, I write books from, from who I am and who my community is. So I'm queer, I'm not trans, and, um, you know, I don't, there's lots of other, you know, identities that I don't experience, but are aware they get left out. The other thing is that having come from the world of disability, like all of my mentors were disabled women, primarily disabled women of color, um, I already know that things that are accessible are better for everyone, right? So making something that's like LGBTQI, whatever, inclusive, actually means it works for everyone really well. Um, so that's why it's important. I, I mean, I think not everyone has to do it, but when we do it, we create a space for more people to kind of come into the conversation. Exactly. And it, it's such a great way of, of including everybody. And I love your, your illustrations with the colors and it's just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Buzzy, you actually defended sex is a funny word when it was challenged at your library. Could you share about that experience? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so the challenge started the way a lot of challenges happen, which is a conversation with a frontline staff member. So a person came up to the desk and the person who happened to be on the, on the desk was the children's librarian who selected the book and they expressed some, some concerns with the, the material. Um, we are really careful to make sure that our frontline staff have some talking points when people um, object, object to a material that we have. So we encourage them to redirect to another material or um, you know, tell them a little bit about just that we serve the general public and that we, um, so we carry materials on a lot of different topics, but this person wanted to pursue it further. And so they actually filled out the form right there at the desk, um, which is the first time I've ever had that happen. Usually the people will take it home and work on it a bit more, but the person filled it out at the desk. So we did what um, what you're supposed to do, which is we refer back to our, our policy. So we have, like um, all libraries have a collection development policy. It has a defined process for requests for reconsideration of materials. And what we did is we, um, actually let me back up a minute. Um, so um, the reason why um, the person challenged the material um, primarily, uh, actually almost exclusively had to do with the fact that Basically, it mentions the existence of transgender people. <laughs> um, so, uh, just a, a couple quotes from the uh, a quote from the the challenge form was: eighty percent of this book is fine, but pushing a confusing sexual agenda is not. And this is pushing children to be unsure and confused. And and there were just a lot of comments like that. So, um, in response to the challenge, we formed a committee. So, the committee was composed of myself and our assistant director, who oversees our librarians, and the children's librarian as the person responsible for um, over for selecting the materials. So, um, we did our homework. We all read the material. We all read the book. We looked to see what else we have in the collection on that topic. We um, looked at reviews. We looked at um, awards, which um, is um, a very award-winning book. Corey, congratulations! Um, in addition to the one that you mentioned, Kristen, it also won the Norma Fleck Award for Canadian Nonfiction, which seems like a pretty big deal. Um, so um, we looked at all of that um, and we ultimately um, decided to retain the material um, in the collection that it was in, which is our, our children's nonfiction collection. Um, and um, so I ended up writing a letter in response to that. Um, in addition to mentioning all the things that you know, the awards and the fact that it had multiple star reviews and that the book met our collection development standards. Um, we also noted in the letter that we particularly appreciated how Corey and Fiona really presented multiple perspectives in the book on complex issues and, and really encouraged its young readers to, to talk about their thoughts with trusted adults. Um, it was, it's just, it's beautifully written, it's beautifully illustrated, as you said. Um, and um, so we sent off that letter and um, the person did not choose to, to challenge it further. 
did they, did you hear from them again? Was there a response? I did not hear from them again, no. And I wasn't familiar with the person from before, um, but I believe that they have still been using the library. So hopefully they, they must have thought the response was, was okay, if not what they wanted. How was the response in your community or your staff? Yeah, so um, our staff um, approached it pretty, um, pretty well. Um, this is the first challenge that, that my library has had in um, quite a long time. Um, we actually couldn't figure out when, um, which is surprising because um, I, I, you know, I don't know how many of the, the people on the webinar are familiar with Oregon, but people outside of Oregon think of us as a, a state with a lot of trees and a lot of very liberal people. Um, which is partially true, but a lot of the state is actually um, has has well, conservative values. I was actually mentioning before before this started, our library is actually on the desert side of Oregon. That a lot of people don't know about, so um, pretty conservative values in our community. So I was a little surprised that this was the first formal challenge that we got. But the staff the staff handled it really well, um, and part of it went just went back to the fact that we have a process and we followed the process. We actually have a question from one of our attendees, and I'm going to um, mention that real quick. Um, Buzzy, do you know if the person who was challenging the material, if they had read the book completely? Yes, yeah, so that's actually a question that we ask on the form. Um, they did not actually answer the question as, did you read it all? But they did say, we did then do follow it up with what portions you review, and they mentioned that they, they read some of the book, but I do not believe that they read all of the book is also my understanding from the staff reports that the person basically picked the book off the shelf, up off, off the shelf and was kind of leafing through it. it they, don't, they didn't check it out. I think they just found it at the library so they probably would not have had the time to read it in its entirety. Um, that's interesting because uh, with all the cases that have come into uh, Sex is a Funny Word, because the book is so graphically beautiful and colorful, that's why people find it on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was in our new book section. So it, we probably had it on display and they just grabbed it. Yeah. Rico, you're not a stranger to challenges. <laughs> this one summer, an award-winning coming of our age tale has been on the most banned and challenged book list in 2016 and in 2018. And in some high schools, students actually needed permission slips to read the graphic novel. Could you talk some about um, the feedback, feedback you've received from readers as well as how you've responded when you hear about your books being challenged? I mean, I think for me it's interesting because there's, there's I think, two different kinds of readers for uh, the work that I do in graphic novels or like, you know, uh, my own personal graphic novels that I do with, uh, with Jillian and uh, with Rosemary. Uh, I feel like adult readers have sort of one feedback and I feel like, uh, I mean, the, the book is complicated and so there's kind of this mixed response that I get from teenagers. I've had teenagers tell me, uh, actually teenagers are <laughs> incredibly critical. So some of my harshest reviews come from 15 year olds where they're like, I didn't get it. I didn't think it was very good. Like, I'm like, well, I won some awards and they're like, that's nice, I didn't like it. Uh, so I feel like I, um, I have heard, uh, like the one most interesting uh, response I got was at a high school in San Francisco, a teenager told me that it gave him serious consideration as to the issue of miscarriage and it actually like, like led him to think about miscarriage as a thing. Like it hadn't occurred to him that it was a thing until, I guess, until he read the book, <laughs> which I was like, well, I'm, I'm happy to introduce the subject of miscarriage to your 15 year old life, you know, like that's my gift to you, I guess. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I feel like it's, uh, it's, um, it's a book that is both very childish and in some ways about that kind of like real freedom of being young and kind of carefree. And on the other hand, it's a very adult book about very heavy things. So it makes sense that the reactions are mixed. Have you had any response from younger readers? Um, well, the, I mean, I always, whenever the, whenever somebody buys the book or sort of like a young person, like now that I write, you know, for Marvel and DC, I've had kids pick up, you know, like a issue of Supergirl and also want to pick up this one summer. And I'm always very clear to point out that they are not the same thing. It's not, uh, not the same kind of book. Uh, and I usually try to make eye contact with the parent, like maybe, you know, like it's, especially if the reader is sort of on the younger side and it's, you know. I always feel like it's rude to ask somebody who's buying your book, like, how old are you? So I, I feel like I sort of 
uh, try to make eye contact with the parent and say like, maybe you should read this first. If the person is a little younger, I say, you know, it's got some, some older themes in it that you might want to check out first. Um, the one of the most interesting reactions I had was actually a teacher reported that a younger student picked up the book from a stack that he had of uh, graphic novels and that the student brought the book back within a matter of minutes and said that the book was making him sad and he didn't want to read it. So he just brought the book back to his teacher and was like, I don't want any more of this, which I thought is the perfect example of, you know, self-selecting, which I think is really, you know, the most important part of any conversation about uh, challenge books or banned books is the process by which younger readers can self-select that the book is or isn't for them. Absolutely. Um, do you think the fact that the book is a graphic novel played any part in it, in the challenges that it receives? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think on the one hand, um, the interesting thing about the book is that it's actually pretty chaste in terms of what it describes, like in terms of what you actually see, like the there's scenes where they're watching horror movies and, you know, discussing things, but it really is verbal, right? Like there's, there's no depictions of violence. There's no depictions of sexuality. It's just kids talking about it. Um, uh, but I do think that the, the sort of, you know, there's a young adult, you know, graphic novel reader now that's reading sort of a mass of books and finding different books. Like maybe they read Raina Tegelmeyer and then they read Molly Ostertag and then maybe, you know, someone like myself and Tilly Walden sort of end up in the sort of later part of that reading experience. So uh, I do think that, that we sort of have had different readers gravitate towards us because of, because of that. Definitely, I, I love graphic novels. Um as just kind of that introduction for a lot of things that leads them to all sorts of things. It's really great. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's actually like graphic, when you say like a graphic novel, there's a sort of like assumption about the content, but really it's like saying film, like you could have something about war, you could have something about relationships. It really is such a, a vast, you know, diversity of content that goes with this medium. Yeah. Jackie, you faced seven challenges to titles about sex and health, bodies and gender identity in a really short amount of time. How did you respond to all these challenges? Well, I would say that the very first concern was from a graphic novel. Um, and it was a parent who was concerned um, that her 13 year old daughter had come across a graphic novel in the young adult section. So she was at the lower end of, of what would be appropriate for young adults usually. And um, it was called Lighter Than My Shadow. Um, and she came across a, um, I mean, it was really relatively short, but came across a um, therapist who was sexually abusing the the um, person in the book um, and it was a I didn't know this when I was talking to the mom but this was a graphic memoir and it was about a, a woman who dealt with um, anorexia so this was a very s small portion of the actual book but the mom was very concerned about it I wasn't familiar with the book when she came to me and um, I said, well, you know, let me look at it. Let me figure out what's going on and I will get back with you. But she checked it out. And, um, and at that time, I had, even though I've been a librarian a long time, I have never really dealt with um, somebody that was kind of on the verge of challenging something. And so I didn't, and I'm going to talk about this later, or Buzzy is about, about having an elevator speech, having something that you can fall back on and talk about. And I have that now, but at the time I didn't. Um, and she went to um, a group of friends who became energized about anything sexual in the library. So I had um, a parent come to me with a stack of six books and they were all marked with sticky notes and of all the things that they were objecting to and she talked to me and I really appreciated that she came to talk to me and I at that point I did talk about you know libraries stand up for um, everybody you know we have materials for everybody in the community not just what may be termed the majority because I do work in a very um, conservative town and um, she 
she didn't like my answer. Um, and so she went through the process of challenging, but she only challenged three of the books. Um, our process was that I, I read the books, I looked at reviews, and I looked at other, um, you know, what other professionals said, and I replied that in a letter that I, um, they would be retained. And she chose not to take that further. So then another woman who never talked to me before challenged three more books and um, and the same process. And I actually, um, after I wrote the reply that retained the books in our collection, she m finally decided to come and meet with me. And we actually had a wonderful conversation. And I was able to talk about how, um, you know, the library is for everybody and not just, you know, a certain segment of people. And even if you don't agree with what may be on the shelf, um, you don't have the right to determine what other people will see. So um, I think for me, the success was to just treat people with respect and to listen, um, to reply with grace and with facts and just, um, I mean, I, I, that's all I can say about that is, is I think it, it really actually in the long run was a positive thing for our library. Um, as far as dealing with the stress, I would say two things. The first is to try not to take it personally, even when it gets personal. Um, and I know that's like hard, but it, it really, for me, I took a ton, I, just so much comfort in knowing that I was standing on the shoulders of all the librarians who have come before me and that we have a profession that upholds intellectual freedom and knowing that we have statements that I could fall back on um, was just a huge comfort. I, I think the second thing is to find your support. Um, in my case, I had a, my husband and my boss were amazing supports during this time, but if you don't have support, then you need to be, um, you know, proactive about finding your support, whether it's other colleagues, family and friends, um, you know, the state, state libraries, the American Library, you, Kristen, um, I know that, or, or other librarians who have gone through this. And I know Buzzy and I would both be willing to talk to anybody who was going through this. So that's, um, those are those two things about dealing with the stress is try not to take it personally and find your support. I often say that there should be a, like a survivor's support group for those who have gone through challenges because um, not only uh, is it so intense and isolating at the time, but when you come out of it, you're almost a different professional and you can help others who are going through it. Just, you know, kind of like a, an AA group. Absolutely. <laughs> it is a unique experience. I will say that. So a cited reason for challenging books about sex, health, gender identity, and adolescence is that books portray a real situation and real facts. Shocking. Um, but this is often quoted by challengers as saying that they are sexually explicit or they're pornographic. Um, so what kind of consequences do you think, and this is for the whole group, um, that having this inaccurate label of, of sexually explicit or pornographic does to potential readers and does to like the reputation of the book and, and who might pick it up? I mean, I, I think it's tricky because, um, and I think that this follows uh, Jackie's point, uh, which is that I, I feel like the label of being sexually explicit uh, tends to fall on LGBTQIA uh, content explicitly, like uh, in terms of, you know, like two boys kissing, which is almost always on the list in part just because its cover has two boys kissing on it, which makes it, I think, a bit of an easy target. I, I think that to some degree, it feels like a misnomer to me. And so I, I tend to 
uh, rebuke this kind of this labeling as being sexually explicit or pornographic when uh, you know like just depicting a relationship itself or depicting the existence of a person depicting the existence of a sexuality that isn't heterosexuality isn't in and of itself uh, pornographic so that's the one issue and then the other issue is I think you know like some of the issues about like sort of sexual explicit or you know basic health issues and the idea of not talking about them you know, it sort of blends into like a larger issue about sort of sex education sort of overall, um, which I think is uh, also, you know, problematic. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting because our next book, um, there's a whole chapter on pornography. So, of course, we're not showing pornography. We're not showing anyone having sex at all. Um, I get, I mean, uh, the thing the thing that comes to mind from a reader, if I was share it from a reader's perspective and also maybe from an educator's perspective, I think it's good and bad when a book is called pornographic. The good thing is when something's got called pornographic, everyone wants to see it, right? And this is this irony of this very list, right? That, that when a book gets on this list, the sales of it go up. And, and, and I'm sure circulation goes up in libraries as well. Um, and so for those people who are trying to, who are complaining about it because they don't think the book should exist or ever be read, what they're doing is very counterproductive to their ends. Um, so, and this is true. I mean, I used to, I have experience working around, you know, in human sexuality with adults as well. So I can say that like, you know, across political spectrums, people are interested in things that are pornography. Um, so in some ways, you know, there's just a thing about like, oh, well, more people are going to read this. And then if they, if they read it and if it's good and it's in interesting, that's useful. Um, the, the drawback, of course, is that it, that means that the reading experience also comes with some shame. Right, that when something is tagged as pornographic, and this is to speak to like what Mariko is saying, the real problem with anything that's sort of queer or the, the way that queer LGBT, well, more like lesbian, gay, and bi um, representation looks is that it gets tagged as pornographic. And then the very idea of having that identity being that is somehow sexual and wrong. Um, so I do think it's complicated because again, you know, the reality is, is that word actually draws people's eyes for reasons that I, are strange, but anyway, it does. I do think one thing that somebody, people say whenever you make the list is like, don't you make money off of this list? Like actually, like one of the questions that goes with the like, have you made like the, you know, it's like, you know, the most wanted list in, in the, or like the most challenged list is like, doesn't that increase your sales? I don't think, I have never seen it definitively in, like affect sales for me personally, but I do think that the sort of counter to that is that it means that the book is available to people who can buy it, but not to the people who want to take it out of the library, right? So it is in terms of access, you know, a lot of people will say, like, well, people will buy your book more and you, people can still buy your book, like, you know, even if they can't get it from the library. But I do think that, you know, there's a whole population of people who depend on that access. And that's, that's the frustrating part of that too. An interesting side note, uh, there's a case going on in, in Alaska right now um, to five classic novels in English curriculum in high school. And um, when I think about the comparison between the, the National Banned Books Week list, the, the most challenged books list, and a situation that's very local where the local bookstore can't keep copies of The Great Gatsby in the store because they're, they're just flying off the shelves. They can't, they're not, you know, and I just think about like, well, I actually, I don't think it's so much the banned books list is that I think a regular, an actual local challenge is what can really boost that sales or that interest. Um, the general person doesn't see those 10 books as anything that special, but if you're in the actual situation, and I'm sure uh, Buzzy and Jackie, you can relate to this, that it, when it's local and it's in your community, that's when people show the interest really, that it would affect sales or circulation statistics. I also wanted to speak a bit to um, Corey's point, point about shame. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of social scientist Brene Brown, but um, she has done some really amazing work on shame that shows just like the sheer mental anguish that it causes. And, and one of the things I've been thinking about with this question is that a lot of times um, victims of sexual abuse, a large reason why they never speak up or don't speak up until well into adulthood is because they were made to feel ashamed of their bodies. Um, and putting these labels on these books that are meant to be negative and shameful is, is it deeply affects people. 
I think that relates to there were books that were on the list. Um, like I think wasn't um, Sherman Alexie's book on the list at some point because it depicted alcoholism mm -hmm. in a family, which really like to me was a way of, you know, making visible the kids whose experiences were invisible, this experience of being in a family like that's dealing with that. So, yeah. Um, so the next question I have for you is librarians and educators are sometimes questioned by library users on why they have titles on sex and health and realities of growing up in their collections. So what advice or talking points can you give on having an honest conversation with those library workers? I'm sorry, library users. Kind of goes to your elevator speech. Yeah, and I'll I'll speak to that. I um I would just ask the question, <laughs> would you rather have a curious adolescent Google or would you rather have them go to a vetted nonfiction book that deals with um, sexuality in a really healthy and objective way. So, you know, and usually if you ask a parent or a concerned patron that, they they kind of stop up short and go, oh, well, that's a point. I also try to emphasize just even though people may not perceive of a particular community as being diverse, there's just a lot of different people that we serve in our communities. And whether they're vocal or not um, is a different question. But um, in my area in particular, there's a lot of skepticism of government. So a lot of times when I'm talking to people, I also uh, will just indicate to them that, do you really want me making deci value decisions on behalf of you or your children? And, and most of them don't. It doesn't matter what their political persuasion is. They really, they don't want to do that. And so we, we have options for people who want them. On a personal note, I was too, I was thinking um, the books as a library user were so helpful to me as a parent to come in and have these talks and discussions with my kids because you don't always know where to start. And so having libraries with a, a whole variety of books and collections, you know, I've got, you know, a variety of ages and you just don't know what's going to kind of pique their interest or where their questions are going to lead and and having some resources was always so valuable. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, this is not, I'm not in that position because I'm not a librarian having this conversation. I mean, the thing that I often find, the, the first thing I want to share is this thing that I, a friend of mine, Hillary North, who's an educator, reminds me of all the time, which I think we forget, those of us who are actually around kids a lot, forget that if you work around kids, your interaction with kids is very different than parents' interactions with kids. And, and I find that parents can very easily forget, well, first of all, this thing that, that I think a couple of you have already uh, pointed out, this thing that we know, which is the kids are their best sensors, right? If a kid is not interested, if, something's, if something feels too much for a kid, they will often just close the book. They rarely will sit and like sort of self-traumatize or something. Um, so that's number one. But the other thing is that I find that a lot of parents forget how capable how, or how, sort of the capacity that kids have for dealing with hard stuff. Um, and it's not, this is not necessarily going to be helpful at a counter, <laughs> the thing to say, but I do, I mean, I share that with parents sometimes. I just remind them that their kids are incredibly resilient. And also I remind them of, to sort of speak to Buzzy's point about diversity is like that their kids have other kids in their lives. If, if their kids are in school um, or even if they go to groups, um, that they have kids in their lives where, again, where violence is ha maybe happening in the home, where substance abuse is happening in the home, where people are queer or gay or lesbian or, you know, where people are disabled, all, all of this stuff. Um, and I actually find, a, I'm not the parents that don't want to hear from me, but the parents that are still there listening often kind of respond to that and, then, and appreciate being reminded. And of course, you do it in a way that doesn't, that, that doesn't downplay all the work they're doing. It's just that because they're the ones raising the kids, their perspective is quite different than ours. Jackie and Buzzy, before the conversation even happens with library users, uh, what are some ways that librarians and educators can prepare for future challenges? Yeah, I can, I can address that first. So um, 
this is um, more a message to to the managers and directors out there. But if you're a frontline worker, I'd say talk to your manager or director about this. Um, make sure that your staff have tools to have these conversations with people because you know, as in our situation, usually that conversation starts at the CERC desk or the reference desk. And um, there are just uh, even just really simple things you can you can have your staff do to to stave off challenges. I think honestly, a lot of people who object to books, we probably don't see a lot of challenges because of the conversations that our staff have. So for instance, you know, our staff, they try to redirect like, oh, I'm sorry that, that, you know, that you didn't enjoy that material. I can help you find something else that's in our collection and make sure that your collection actually backs up that, that up. Um, also just talking about, you know, well, we serve a lot of different people and we try to have a lot of different books um, in the collection. Um, so that'd be one thing is just, you know, make sure that the, the people who are handling these questions at the start have some tools. Um, the other big one, which I've already talked about is just make sure you have a policy Make sure your collection poli development policy is up to date, um, that it has a process for that you follow, and that you have a form that you use, and that you also, um, the staff are aware of that, your library board or your decision makers are aware of that. It's really important. Um, one actual the, uh, minor recommendation I would give on that policy is um, to before giving the person your request for reconsideration form, require that they talk to somebody first. So like they have to talk to a manager or the your head of collection development or whatever. I've had some of those conversations and a lot of time that ends up resulting in the challenge is never submitted. Um, I'm not saying, um, you know, we've definitely had some uh, submitted, of course, but um, but a lot of times you can explain it to the person without having to create a big process that, that ends up being difficult for everybody involved. And I would add to that, um, to know where your stakeholders stand on this issue. I was very, very fortunate in that my boss and the mayor um, were very supportive, but um, it could have gone the other way and I wouldn't have known it beforehand. So um, wh whoever your stakeholders are, in my case, it was the city manager, the mayor, the council, and my board. Um, and, but to know where they stand, and if you don't, to have that conversation with them and to use it as an, um, as an opportunity to maybe teach them about intellectual freedom and what is at stake. But even, even if they don't, you know, if you don't convert them or whatever, it at least you know where you stand if this happens. Um, and that kind of goes to the next thing on, on my list, which is to, um, I'm a firm believer in counting the cost and setting your mind. And so while you're quiet and not in that situation, to really decide how far am I willing to go for the sake of intellectual freedom in libraries. Um, in my case, I was going through all this um, during budget season. And while they couldn't come out and fire me, they could certainly have gutted my budget for the next year, but they did not. Um, so I was, I was very pleased, but I knew that that was a, a possibility because like I said, we do have a, a pretty conservative um, board and community. And um, so you need to make those decisions, I think, beforehand so that you don't have to worry about it when you're in the middle of the um, washing machine. And the last thing I would say, um, because we have some amazing documents that we that govern what we do, um, the Code of Ethics from ALA, the Library Bill of Rights, um, the Freedom to Read statement. There's also nine other statements that deal with intellectual freedom and govern what we do as librarians. And I think we forget what they say. So I kind of put it on my calendar to read one a month just so that I remind myself what it is that I, that I stand for and what, um, and what I do. Oh, I love that idea. That is such a great idea. In fact, I've often talked about doing them at staff meetings too, and like bringing in and having these discussions. Um, yeah, we we often forget, and that's why I love having conversations like this because it kind of reminds us of of those values, of those documents, and and puts 
you know, we, we put ourselves in those situations. What would I do if I was in Jackie's situation, if I was in Buzzy's situation, and how would I have handled that? And where, because it, it's such a personal, ethical decision, you know, mm -hmm. yes, our professional values, but we're the one that has to, as librarians, put that risk out there. You know, we might get our budgets cut. We could be slandered in the media. You know, my name was all over the blogosphere <laughs> as a purveyor of pornography, you know, and it's, it's a hard decision to make. Um, but it's, it's something that is called on us by our, our profession, but we need to be able to make that decision ethically, you know, within our own personal mm -hmm. ethics. It can be really difficult. And having that support of your stakeholders is also really, really important. There can be a lot of um, other organizations that can help out too, whether local um, health organizations that can talk about sex education. In addition to books being challenged on this topic, we see a lot of um, programs or displays that are also challenged um, based on this topic, labeling them as sexually explicit. Um, can you think of any other organizations or places that could support you or that you could work with and collaborate with to provide access to this kind of information and to defend access to this information? I think that um, I'm going to steal one of <laughs> what the county health department is certainly one and the schools are important collaborators in this. Yeah, we worked with our um, county health department, um, which was um, for us was facilitated somewhat because that we are also a county department, but we, for instance, were invited to a middle school health fair that they did. And we were one of the only organizations that was actually able to bring um, materials on gender identity and sexual orientation. And so that was really um, helpful. We've also worked some with, with PFLAG, um, which is a support organization for members of the LGBTQIA community. And um, one of the things, um, this is a little bit of a side, but, but um, PFLAG often uses our meeting rooms. And that's actually something that I, I really like seeing for libraries that are fortunate enough to have meeting rooms is just inviting organizations of different kinds into your into your, your library to have space and to, to do things so that people get familiar um, with what they do. But, but um, PFLAG has been a great partner for us too. I was reading through the article from the Alaska case, forgive me, it's right on my mind because they just had their board meeting last night. Um, but the number of people who spoke at the school board meeting um, in favor of retaining the books, they had people from the Education um, Educators Association, they had health officials, um, there was an attorney who spoke, um, she does a lot of domestic violence and sex crimes, um, and she spoke about the statistics of, of um, statistics of of abuse in their state and their community and how that went to defend it. So um, legal organizations and health or organizations and educating organizations can play such an important role in, in how, in the information that we provide, provide access to, but it can also help in defending our materials as well. Um, what are some of the benefits you can see by having topics um, titles on our shelves that are specific to health and sex or, and gender identity. Um, so um, kind of to, uh, to a point that Corey made, um, parenting's awful. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard um, and we can't all do it alone. And it's, I think it's, it's really helpful to have some materials that help you um, talk through some pretty difficult conversations with your children. I mean, I have an 11 year old stepson, so he's just at that age where he's starting to get curious about these things. And, and actually, you know, I'm not glad that we, Corey's book was challenged, but it, it exposed me to a book that actually now we have, um, we've actually read with my stepson. That's really helpful to have something um, that um, somebody who knows what they're talking about and can just um, make parenting a little bit less difficult. Um, I think that was a paraphrase. I don't think I actually said parenting is awful, although it is. Um, <clears throat> but so the other things, the other things that I'm just very aware of, and I, and I wasn't aware of it until I wrote a book, um, was how much, for so many people that having a book legit, legitimizes the topic. 
So if there's a book on it, then it must be real and important, which is, a, you know, it's a foolish way of thinking about the world because people, you know, only certain people get to write books, only certain books get published. But nonetheless, I think that having it there, while it also becomes this lightning rod that you then have to defend, it legitimizes the topic. The other thing that I think is so important about it is that that sex and gender are parts of our everyday life. And particularly in the United States, but kind of across North America, they're so segregated. They're so seen as this, this thing, this sex, sex and this gender. So to me, having a, a public place that has books on like uh, the environment and you know how to drill for oil and cars and dinosaurs and sex is actually very important because it just makes, it's just like one other way that we make sex and gender, we remind people that sex and gender is actually part of life and it's as important as any of the other topics. And I don't think it's any more important, but, um, but it should be in there. I think if you think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I would just add that, you know, libraries are known for leveling the playing field. And so to make sure that everybody has access to the information that they need, regardless of whatever group you want to put them in, is just really important. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a crucial point of agency where you get to, you know, I mean, there is like a stepping off point where you go and discover the things that you are interested in instead of just being guided by your parents to the things that they think you should know. And I think libraries are a really crucial part of that. For me, it was my school library where I was able to just sort of investigate very timidly things that I thought I might be interested in in this very private way, you know, like it is, and it is like, as you said, it's certainly much better than a Google search on like, if you just put lesbian into a Google search, like, you know, <laughs> you know, you're on your own. Like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a harsh world out there. Um, but I think that, uh, for me, it was definitely uh, a place where I could, you know, find uh, information. And I think it is validating in this way that is, like, as Corey said, it's not necessarily uh, true that the only valid things are in books. But it was definitely a huge thing for me as a teenager to have things that were validating, to have, like, you know, as for me, it wasn't, uh, for me, it wasn't nonfiction, it was fiction. But those things, absolutely, people like Jeanette Winterson and you know, uh, I want to say Well of Loneliness. I think I did look at Well of Loneliness and then I was like, well, maybe this isn't me. <laughs> uh, but those things were, were huge in my life. So Mariko, Corey, what are you guys working on now? You should go first, don't get one. Uh, well, so Fiona and I are working on our third book in the series. So it'll be out next year. It's giant. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about how big it is. It's really big. Um, it's a comic book. And so it just goes, I mean, it's, and it's, and it's both the, some, you know, it's the topics we've covered, but just uh, 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 for puberty age kids. So it is getting, so we do have a whole section on pornography and how we talk about it and what it is. Um, there's more about power and oppression and violence and racism, and then lots about gender and lots about bodies, and then a lot about consent as well. So that is Fiona's, so Fiona's doing the final drawings now. So it'll be, I don't know exactly when, but it will be out next year. I'm so excited for your book. I'm so excited for it. I feel like it's like, ugh, very, very excited. Uh, I'm working on uh, Wonder Woman uh, for DC Comics right now. Uh, I also am working on a book uh, for them, for their uh, younger reader series called I Am Not Starfire, uh, which is essentially about Starfire's uh, fat goth daughter, <laughs> if anyone is a Teen Titans fan. Um, and uh, I'm doing a Willow series for Boom Studios, uh, which is gonna be coming out, I don't know, soon hopefully. Uh, and then I'm working on a, a prose um, teen murder mystery uh, called Who Will Live, uh, which is about, uh, yes, all the, all the dark things. It's, it's, like a, it's like broad church for teenagers, basically, if you're a fan. Wow, how do you keep all your projects straight? <laughs> Uh, I have like eight notebooks uh, and I have a different notebook for each one. Um, actually also because now I'm editing so for Shirley books uh, I've recently been uh, editing uh, Grace Ellis's uh, graphic novel uh, which is one of our first uh, um, uh, which is uh, about uh, Patricia Highsmith. Uh, so sort of our attempt to bring some like queer history, uh, more queer history to comics. Um, so 
very excited about that as well. You know, that leads me into a great question from one of our audience members um, that asked, what's the difference between a graphic novel and a comic? Oh, uh, essentially they're the same thing. Uh, so graphic novel is basically a term that the, uh, the sort of publishing world came up with to make comics seem more like books. Um, essentially a comic is like a story told uh, by art uh, images in sequence uh, with text uh, in the form of narration and dialogues. But yeah, basically the same thing. Within the industry, comics, you know, tends to refer to sort of the trade sort of floppy publications of uh, published by places like DC and Marvel and graphic novel tends to refer to something with the spine. Um, but, you know, real comic book nerds will tell you that it's the same thing. That's so interesting. Um, there was a question from one of our members about uh, Jackie, if you could give an example of your elevator speech, but I think both of you have one, right? Jackie, you're muted. Jackie, you're muted. Thank you. Um, why don't you ask me a question so I can respond to it? I mean, I could. Um, like a like an example question? OK, I know what I can do. Um, so one of the conversations that I had when I was going through all this is um, a gentleman was talking to me about um, trans literature and he didn't obviously want it in the library and one of the things he said and I'm making up this um, the statistic because I don't remember the statistic but he said so did you know that 40% of all trans teens tr attempt suicide whether they tran transition or not how do you feel about that and um, and it was a pretty antagonistic exchange. And I just said, I, um, how I personally feel about that is not the issue here. As a librarian, my job is to uphold intellectual freedom and the freedom to read. So that's, that's my elevator speech. That's a good one, definitely. Fuzzy, do you have one? Um, so, so kind of like Jackie, a lot of it has to do with with the way the question is asked. But, but um, my speech, I say a lot is, as I mentioned before, we serve a lot of different people in this community. Like I think more so than almost any other institution in our community, we see the broad cross section of the public, and as a result of that, we try to have something that 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 satisfy that, that any, every anyone can can be interested in and as a result of that it means that sometimes we're going to have things in our collection that just you're not going to like there's things in our collection i don't personally like them um there's things in our collection that i personally really like and um that's just part of what it means to be an institution that serves everybody that's a great response do you um as library directors do you go out of your way to purchase the books that end up on the banned books list or if you don't already own them? Do you want to start, Buzzy? Sure, I can start. So um, one of the things that I've found over the years of looking at these banned books lists is that the books that end up on them tend to be award-winning, very well-reviewed, <laughs> um, and popular mm -hmm. already. So um, I don't wouldn't say that I specifically or the staff, my staff who select specifically go out and seek them out, but a lot of times we already have them because they're things that interest people. Um, and that honestly is part of the reason why they're challenged is because other people know that they're popular and interesting. And um, But um, it, it definitely does whenever, uh, you know, I see a new one, it definitely does make me go and look at my collection and see, hey, what do I have on this topic? Do I have a diverse number of things on this topic? Might this book be something? But um, but yeah, it, it, I think indirectly, yes, but, but a lot of times we already have those materials or similar ones. And I would totally agree. I mean, you follow your collection development policy. So, um, you know, if I already have a, a good selection in that particular subject, I may not purchase it, but if I don't, then I will. So it's, but I don't go out um, and specifically try um, 
on the other hand, I'm not going to not have them either. I mean, and generally they are, um, they are like Buzzy said, they're already in the collection anyway. Yeah, we think we've found that to be pretty common. There's rarely um, the the book on the list that's never been heard of before that everyone's like, oh, hmm, I guess I should go get that one. Maybe if it's a brand new author. I know when um, Angie Thomas was doing Hate You Give, that was she was a fairly new author, uh, new book, and and though she was incredibly popular and and it's an incredible book, maybe not everybody had it yet. So that was would have been one of the things I could see. Let's see. Looking at some of the questions from our audience members, um, I she asks. I know we're talking about sex, but are there other topics? that have come up that people have a problem with? Sorry, I'm sure that was a question for librarians, but I um, Oh, is it okay if I just go, say one? Go ahead, Corey. Just, just because it's a book that I'm starting to work on right now. It, and I don't know, I'll be interested to hear what Buzzy and Jackie have to say, but in my experience, race. So the, the, the thing that I wrote publicly, like online, uh, uh, that got the most hate, more than anything about like, how do you talk to kids about masturbation or whatever, is a thing I wrote about being white and talking to my kid about race. So I'm aware now that I'm starting to work on another book that's just about, for kids, about race, that is a topic that people get very, very, uh, well, that white people get very, very um, angry about. I would agree with that. I would also add, because this was part of my saga, was um, that anything to do with witchcraft, um, especially nonfiction, and it can can really stir up a lot of um, a lot of emotion. Yeah, I'd, I'd say generally it's just all those topics you're allegedly not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. You know, sex, politics, race, and religion um, are the big ones. Yeah, it was funny bringing up witchcraft again, even though it's fiction, um, the Harry Potter series is back on the list because the, um, they claimed that the spells were real. So it is, to them, I guess, nonfiction. So anyways. <laughs> um, in your experience with book challenges, do you see that they're usually from lone individuals or are they coming from more organized group where someone might email um, or put on social media something and then tell people about it to come and get them to take the books off the shelf. I have seen both. Um, this particular one was a lone individual, but I've also seen ones that were done by groups of people. I um, was a um, library specialist in a school for a while and I had probably the most bizarre challenge I've ever had, which was a challenge to the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. in our library and it was because very small town like 1500 people and they had a, a once a month column by a man that was talking about what it's like being gay in a rural community and as a result of that they did not want the newspaper which was the newspaper of record for the school district included on the shelf and that was like that was a lot of people a lot of people wanted us to remove it and yeah. ultimately because it was the newspaper of record the school was like yeah we can't do that <laughs> Kristen, I'm so sorry, but everything is breaking up. So. Okay. Well, we're just about done. We're just about wrapping up. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much to our amazing panelists. Thank you to Jackie and Buzzy, Corey and Mariko. It's just been really fantastic. Um, and we have some great questions. I hope it continues to inspire the conversation. Um, we know about these challenges from, from Buzzy and Jackie because they've been reported in the ones about Corey's book and this one, Summer. Um, please, I encourage everybody to continue to report censorship when you see it so that we can provide support to people who need it um, and to defend the books, get them back into the hands of the readers and the schools and the public libraries that need them um, and the parents who desperately want them to help parent because it's awful sometimes.
So thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple more webinars scheduled um, on this series, the Band Books Uncensored, and I hope that you would continue to join us. Thank you again for your participation. This was a wonderful conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you.